Hey everybody, welcome to Chin Fat. I had a couple questions from viewers asking about doing a successful tracking shot. And one thing that I really think makes a tracking shot uh, stand out, uh, I mean, you could take a camera, you could put it on uh, like all the automatic settings, put it on a gimbal and, and do, do this type of shot following somebody. But one thing that you'll notice that's kind of different with this shot is, and, and if you watch movies and see the tracking shots in movies, oftentimes the background is very out of focus and the subject is in sharp focus. Now, when you're following a person, the camera can move back and forth a little bit and change distance and when you have a very uh, shallow depth of field, that person, it is difficult to keep that person in focus. So I ended up using a very affordable camera, the Sony a6600, which we'll get into and start talking about. The, the autofocus continuous feature is a really nice feature that tracks the face and keeps everything in focus. So let's go through uh, the settings on your camera and some techniques that you need to know about to get this look. Keep in mind, this is going to be a very extensive, uh, in-depth tutorial. So if you want somebody that's uh, quicker and shorter, uh, don't watch this one. Go watch elsewhere because I'm going to get into depth of field. I'm going to describe focal length, depth of field, ISO, just kind of all these different settings. Not just how to do it, but what these settings are doing to achieve this type of look. So put on a pot of coffee and sit down and get ready. Okay, now to get started, uh, to achieve this look it can be difficult because I am manipulating something called depth of field. And to get this sort of depth of field, you have to have the right tools. And one of those tools is going to be the proper lens, a lens that can achieve this sort of look through uh, opening up your aperture. And what I mean by depth of field is basically, uh, okay, if we're looking on top of a person here, not down on a person here, we got our camera in front of the person here. Uh, now depth of field is how much is in focus in front of the camera. That means, let's say from your image sensor here, this is maybe uh, six feet away to the subject. So let's say that you're in focus from about five feet. We'll say that that is five feet in front of the camera, and then it falls out of focus, let's say maybe four feet away from there. So uh, at five feet, is where it, it comes in focus and then it starts going out of focus, perceived focus at um, at eight feet. Or did I say nine? I can't remember. Uh, let, let's say nine. Out of focus at at nine feet. So that would be essentially your depth of field is that's uh, nine minus five is four feet. So you've got four feet that is in focus that this actor can stay within. Uh, when it comes to manipulating depth of field, there's several things that you can do. You can bring the, the subject closer to the, the camera. As subjects get closer to the camera, the depth of field becomes more uh, what we call shallow. That means you get less depth of field than you might have up to maybe one, one to two feet as this person gets, I don't know, a few feet away, from, or like three feet away from the camera. Uh, as the person goes further away, that depth of field opens up and becomes more deep. That means you have more depth of field, so, so more will be in focus. Another thing that affects uh, depth of field is uh, focal length, but if you zoom in on somebody, uh, when you zoom in on somebody, you get a shallow depth of field, but then the camera becomes more shaky. You start noticing the shakiness a little bit more. Uh, so what I recommend using is on, on your lens, Sorry, I don't have very good writing in Photoshop here. But your f-stop. Your f-stop is basically a measurement of your aperture, of how open your aperture is. As your iris moves, it creates an aperture. Your aperture is the diameter of the, the, the amount of light that is coming in your camera. Your iris can close down or open up, and you can have an iris that's either uh, very closed like this or very open. And that number of your f-stop comes from an equation, which is basically your focal length. Your focal length is how far away your lens is from your image sensor. So this is your lens right here, and it's basically how far away it is from your image sensor. So within your lens housing, you have your iris. Your iris is that mechanism that allows light to come in, and then your aperture is going to be the distance, that diameter of how far it is from one side of the, uh, the opening to the other side there that lets the light in. So first of all, to describe focal length, the focal length is going to be the distance between what is called the optical center of the lens, which is essentially where the light begins to bend inside your lens, uh, but the distance between your lens and your image sensor is your focal length. So this may be like 50 millimeters away. Now, if your lens gets closer, if you have a variable focal length lens, which is a zoom lens, your lens can travel within the lens housing and get closer to the, to the image sensor. And what you get as a difference here is you get a wider angle of view. As you start getting further away, if you get further away here, if you get maybe like 80 millimeters away, let's say that this is 80 here, and this one is, I don't know, maybe 30 millimeters away, then as you zoom out and your lens goes further away from your image sensor, then you tend to get more of a telephoto field of view. So it's a more narrow field of view. So you're going to see a lot more with your wide angle lenses than you will with your telephoto lenses. Now back to f-stop. F-stop is a measurement of, now inside your lens, you're going to have your iris mechanism here. You're going to have that mechanism that lets light in here. And uh, that me the measurement of this circle here that's letting light in is your aperture. So it's basically uh, the diameter of that measurement there from one side of the circle to the other. That's your diameter. And let's say that this is, uh, we got it opened up to where it is 25 millimeters. 
So it's 25 millimeters across. Now this is where your f-stop number comes from. It is basically, basically your f-stop is a measurement of focal length divided by your aperture, and that equals your f-stop. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens, you have a 25 millimeter or aperture, your aperture is open to uh, 25 millimeters, that means you can fit that aperture two times within your focal length. That means the size of the aperture will fit your will fit within the focal length two times. So 50 millimeters divided by 25 gives us a 2.0, and that is your f-stop. Now think about that. If it, if it is wider, if this is more open or less open, this means you can fit it many times. Let's see, it's at that right there, and we fit that size of circle in here. One, two, three, four, five. That would basically give us what we can say that is around a five. Now, the, F, the standard f-stop scale is based on stops cutting your light in half or doubling the amount of light hitting your image sensor. That's what the standard f-stop scale is for as you go from those numbers. But the higher the number goes on your f-stop, the smaller the circle is going to be, and the lower you go on your f-stop, the larger the circle is going to be because you're fitting it in, the, in, in that space less because it's bigger. Now, something that happens when you open up your iris, it changes what's called the circle of confusion. I'm not going to get into that right now, but just for all intents and purposes, just know that when you open up your iris more, your depth of field shrinks significantly. And when you stop down, and when you stop down and you have a smaller aperture, your depth of field is going to increase. So the more open it is, when, you're, when your iris is like this very large, when your aperture is very large like this compared to this, so a large aperture is going to give us a very shallow depth of field, and a very small aperture is going to put more in focus and give us a very deep depth of field. With that being said, uh, the lens that you use is going to be very important in, in getting that, that shallow depth of field. I'm kind of going on the cheaper end of the cameras here, and this would be exaggerated if you had a camera with a large image, image sensor. I'm using a Sony a6600. One reason I chose this is because it's very affordable. It does have a smaller image sensor. The size of your image sensor will, make, will change the depth of field as well. With a smaller image sensor, this is not a 35 millimeter image sensor. This is, the Sony 6600 has an APS-C image sensor, which is a, approximately half the size of a 35 millimeter image sensor. But once again, I'm kind of going on the cheaper end of the cameras here. I know it's, it's kind of difficult to get a, a more affordable camera with a full 35 image sensor, like the A7S 3 or A7S 2 but that can be around like a three to $4,000 camera. So with this camera, the 6600, this is around, this comes in around twelve to $1,400, depending on where you get it. You can even kind of achieve this effect with a 6400 or 6300 as well. But the reason why I went with the 6600 is because they have, uh, this has approved ability to track uh, a subject and keep them in focus. So normally on, on a normal movie, you'd have somebody that's running follow focus and trying to keep the subject in focus. But on this, we're going to achieve it with the A6600 with a very, way more affordable camera. Now, the type of lens that I'm using here is a 35 millimeter Sony lens uh, called the optical steady shot lens. It's, it is able to open up to a 1.8, which is which will create a very shallow depth of field, especially if you bring the subject uh, maybe three or four feet away from the camera. If you send them a distance away from the camera, they're gonna, everything's going to become in focus eventually. But as you get them like three or four feet from the camera, you're going to have opened up to 1.8, you're going to have a very narrow depth of field. So let's go through some of the camera settings here and talk about how you would set this camera up or how you'd set. And you can pretty much do this with any camera as long as you have a faster lens, something that, that is uh, maybe 2.0 or, or less on, on your f-stops. It's a capable of opening up to 2.0 or less. I shot the footage at a variety of different uh, speeds here. I did 120 frames per second, I did 60 frames per second, and I did 24 frames per second. So I did the higher frame rate so I could do some slow motion and kind of test out the slow motion look and see what we get. But the first thing I did is I got inside the camera and set up my man set this up on manual exposure. So you want to be able to control ISO, you want to be able to control your shutter speed, and you want to be able to control your iris manually. So my file format I changed depending on if I was shooting 120 frames per second or 60. If you shoot at 120 or 60 frames per second inside the Sony, it, it, keep in mind it will take you from, you will not be able to shoot in 4K anymore. It will take it down to 1920 by 1080, but still looks pretty good. Shooting at a 24 frame per second standard, a film standard, I put my shutter speed at a standard shutter speed, which would be basically around 1 48th of a second. If you're shooting 24 frames per second in film, you typically, uh, not always, but you typically, and generally speaking, you you would shoot at half exposure time per frame, which would equal 1 48th. Now with these, uh, with these Sony cameras, they don't uh, shoot to exactly 1 48th of a second. You can come close by doing measuring it in tenths uh, to 1 50th. 1 50th is of a second exposure time is will be the closest you can get to 1 48th of a second. Now the other thing you want to want to change is your iris here. I'm using my, since I've got everything on manual exposure, I'm using the top wheel here to change my iris. And this is a digital lens, so it will so it's operated through the wheel on the camera. 
And I'm going to, and it, it does open up to 1.8, but I ended up shooting around 2.2. And the reason why is because uh, the, the, when you have your lenses all the way open, the lens tends to be just slightly softer than it is if you stop down just a little bit. Most lenses tend to have their most the most amount of clarity one stop away from being completely open. So I set it at around a 2.2, which is still going to give me a fairly, fairly sh shallow depth of field. One other thing I set up in the camera, and this is where it gets impressive, where you do not need to have another person uh, running focus for you, is uh, Sony's autofocus continuous mode. And a lot of mirrorless cameras these days and a lot of DSLRs do have autofocus features for video. To me, Sony has been one of the most impressive. It has a really nice face tracking software. In fact, you'll, you can see that on the screen as you'll see a little square around the screen that's tracking the face as you're trying to focus on somebody. So I put this on autofocus continuous. If your lens has an autofocus switch, you'll have to turn that on as well or, or it will manually override the functions inside the menus if you don't have your, your lens turned on to the autofocus. And this lens does not have the switch. It's just controlled in camera. Now the other thing is the focus area. I tried this out on wide and I tried this out on center and if you have a subject it seems to work better on center than it does wide. Wide gets the whole frame and sometimes it would coast to the, the background and get other things uh, in the background uh, rather than stay on the subject. Center seemed to really keep on the subject even when the subject was offset and what was not in the center necessarily. If you want your ISO very clean now, now one thing that I did for for the camera here is I set it up into, I did a couple tests and I set up one with my picture profile off, which gives it a, a certain level of contrast and saturation. And then I sh shot also in uh, S-Log. And by default, the picture profile number eight on the Sony is already set in S-Log. So S-Log three, which works well, pretty pretty well outside, gives you a higher dynamic range for outside. Because when I tried it with the picture profile off, the highlights kind of blew out a little bit and lost a little bit of detail. But when I put it in S-Log, I was able to grade it and keep everything in detail. And it gave a really nice uh, dynamic range. It just comes across really flat at first, but you have to take it into the software and grade it in the software. And it really comes out and looks really, really nice, preserving the details in the darks and in the highlights. So outside, I decided to shoot in S-Log3. With S-Log3 on the 6600, the ISO will not let you go below 500. So we did have a little bit, ended up having a little bit of noise in the shot, which I ended up fixing. I ended up grading this in Resolve. And there's an option in DaVinci Resolve. It, it is the studio version of DaVinci Resolve, not the, the, not the free one, uh, that has the spatial and temporal uh, noise reduction option. It's an effect that it does a, an amazing job of cleaning up noise. And I'll kind of get into that and show you uh, how I did that to clean up the grain because yeah, with the ISO settings and shooting out shooting in log especially in the 1920 by 1080 mode when it's doing doing a uh, high frame rate uh, you could really see some of the noise on, in in the darks and sometimes you can kind of clean that up even in premiere a little bit by just uh, adding some contrast to the image but resolve did a great job of cleaning that up and uh, I'm, ve I'm very impressed with that so my settings once again were 1 50th on the shutter speed i shot at an f 2.2 once again you have to have a lens it's a very fast lens that opens up means your lens opens up very wide to around maybe a 2.0 or less this opens up to 1.8 which made me uh, be able to go to about a 2.2 and just bring out some of the clarity in the image my iso i dialed down to uh, as low as i could get it to get as clean as images as i could outside now when you use these settings right here and you go outside so these are the settings that i want right here on this camera now now when you go outside the issue is especially in the bright daylight this is going to be completely blown out and everything's going to be very overexposed and you'll be tempted to maybe turn up your shutter speed uh, that will change the look of it you'll have more of a stuttery look instead of kind of that filmic look and if you stop down on your iris so you can bring the exposure back but then your depth of field will completely disappear and the background will be in focus so a good solution is using a variable nd and you probably don't want to go too cheap on your variable ND. What variable ND is, is basically neutral density. It's a, very, a glass that will change. It's basically like putting sunglasses in front of your lens, where you're able to keep your iris really open, a lower shutter speed, uh, and, uh, and still you're able to get a good exposure by using one of these little things. This is from a company called Gobi, which is, which is a little bit more expensive than most variable NDs, but this one has some pretty good glass. You can get away with it by using others. But the thing I like about this one here is their NDX filter is that it has two pieces of opposing polarized glass uh, that will eventually start canceling itself out and make the lens and will make the uh, ND darker and lighter by by rotating. It's basically two pieces of glass that you rotate and it will turn the glass darker or lighter. You can see that here. 
the thing I like about their variable ND is it almost goes all the way dark. It, it pr almost closes out all light. So you can get this exactly where you need it to get the perfect exposure. Now the other thing is you got to make sure that you got the right ring size. The ring size of this lens is 49 millimeter and whatever lens you have you can look around and, fi and find the information on the lens that will show what ring size it has. And it has this little symbol here uh, that shows what this little circle with a line through it is basically the ring size, the filter size for your for that specific lens. So this one was 49. So I purchased a 49 millimeter uh, Gobi variable ND lens and I'm going to screw it onto the front of the camera here, onto the lens. You got to be kind of careful when you put these filters on because if you kind of miss the threading, you can turn it. If you turn it really hard, it will it will destroy the threading. So you got to make sure that it's easy to turn, that you got to make sure that the filter kind of clicks into place and turns and you don't want to monster tighten it on. I put it kind of snug so I can still rotate the glass, uh, but you don't want it going too snug or they can be very difficult to take off. With this feature, with our iris uh, very open uh, and we rotate our variable ND, we are able to get the proper exposure. So watch here. This is what it's going to look like when you go outside. It's going to be very, very washed out. Now, if we rotate the filter, you're going to be able to have your settings nailed exactly where you want them. Oops, I got my f-stop at 1.8, so it's all the way up in there, but you know the settings I, I recommended. But as you rotate that, you can get it down to the exposure that you want. And if you're shooting in S-log, I would recommend shooting about one stop over overexposed. So pay attention to the meter. I would recommend going into the function key, go to metering mode under the function key and find this metering mode here and you're going to put that metering mode and you will put that mode into multi. Multi will give you kind of a general exposure of your entire frame and it will be measured here it will be measured at the bottom here in these on your light meter and your light meter you're going to want to get kind of if you're shooting in log you'll want to get it generally speaking about a one stop overexposed if you're not shooting in log and you're shooting in some sort of picture profile like a very saturated or or, or or even turning the picture profile completely off you'll want to kind of nail your exposure right at zero right here i'm going to set my nd here rotate my nd with all my settings programmed into place you're going to set your nd so it's about one stop overexposed and then you'll be set so before I did the footage, I went out to the location and on the subject, I got I set it about one stop overexposed and it really uh, preserved the details and the highlights and the darks. So the gimbal that I use is a DJI Ronin S. So the Ronin S kit is a gimbal kit that comes in around anywhere from like three to $500, depending on how many accessories you want to throw into it. There are some other options out there that you can find, but I find that the DJI has the best uh, gimbal ability. It seems to respond the best. It has the best features. Uh, but there are a few out there that you can get around like four or $500 that are still pretty decent gimbals as well. Now with the Sony, I found that the, the Sony was a little too light for this gimbal, a little too small for the, this gimbal. It, these cameras keep getting smaller and smaller, so I ended up sliding my mic on top to add a little extra weight. Then I actually took the Ronin uh, Velcro strap and type, uh, and it just needed a little bit more. So I wrapped it around the microphone and it gave just a little extra weight to be able to balance the gimbal just perfectly. Because when you balance these gimbals, they need to be balanced so you can just rotate them around and they kind of stick in their place and they don't and they don't swivel when you let go of them. It's, you can almost put it in any position and it will just stay there. If you don't get your gimbal like that, it can burn out the motor. So you got to be really careful about that. You, if Whatever gimbal you get, look up how to, um, how to balance them properly so you get the optimal experience out of them. So with that, if you have a gimbal, you get a very smooth shot, went out and practiced it a little bit and got ready to shoot the subject. And I basically just shot the subject, stay in front of them, walking on a road to make sure I wasn't going to be tripping over anything on the sidewalks or anything. So you got to be careful if you're walking backwards with these things, you want to be careful where you're walking so you don't trip over something, fall over, break yourself or break your camera. You don't want to do that. Now, the last thing I kind of want to talk about is I decided to shoot this outside. I mean, you can do this inside. Inside, there's a lot more obstacles. So I decided just to go out and test this shot outside to see how it would look. Uh, and Sony and the Sony camera kept the subject in very sharp focus. It looked really, really nice. Uh, even when I kind of rotated around the head it seemed to kind of lock to the head and keep the head in focus uh, so this did a, did a pretty darn good job but let's talk about lighting if you're shooting outside and I shot outside uh, during the daytime so think about the positioning of the sun I shot this in two different ways first of all walking with the camera we have this I had the subject in front of me and the sun in one in one instance the sun was shining directly toward the subject like this was behind the camera shining toward the face and here's an example of that so if you look at this this looks decent but I, I did move the camera slightly to the side so I got shadows on one side of the face and added, uh, with this I had shadows on uh, the right hand side of the face so camera left I had shadows on that side of the face and the sun was blowing up on this side so we did get a little bit of uh, a little bit of dramatic shadows kind of going on there, which was nice. But, but then the other one, way I shot was basically had the subject walking toward the camera 
with the sun behind the subject to create kind of a backlight. So just think about which kind of way you want it. I kind of like the little bit more the dramatic type, but if you do this and you're on a smaller gimbal, uh, I was not able to put a matte box on, on the camera which would block out lens flare. I got a little bit of lens flare, which I thought kind of looked cool. But uh, if you're trying to avoid lens flare and you're trying to get this uh, this backlight lit sun, you might need some sort of matte box uh, on or some sort of uh, uh, lens hood on that's going to block out the lens flare with this specific lens. And once I put on the ND, I was not able to, I could not fit a lens hood onto the actual lens anymore because the filter, because the filter was too large. So just consider that when you're shooting, do you want lens flare? Do you not? You might have to come up with a solution to have some sort of lens hood on or something that blocks that blocks the 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 light from going directly into the lens and creating those flares if you don't want them. But yeah, let's look at comparison kind of side by side here and look at the one with the sun blasting the face directly and the one with the sun backlighting the subject. Now I want to go into Resolve and kind of show you a couple things that I did in here to, to, to grade this and clean it up. When you're shooting in Log, once again, Premiere's got a really powerful uh, color grading ability, but there's a couple things that in that are in DaVinci Resolve that really kind of make a little bit of a difference with log. And first of all, one of those things are the pivot on when you're doing a contrast. Uh, what contrast does, first of all, is it spreads the it spreads out your highlights and your darks from each other. It sends your it makes your darks darker, makes your highlights brighter. So look at what happens when I grab the contrast slider here at the bottom and start dragging it across. It starts uh, sending the dark, making the darks darker and the highlights brighter, and therefore it creates contrast. So let's look at the before and after here. If I hit uh, Shift D, it turns that on. It bypasses the the node there and shows you the before and after with the contrast. And the other thing you got, see now the darks are starting to get a little too dark, but I like the uh, the light on the face there, the brightness of the light on the face. So they have what's called the pivot. The pivot decides where the the middle point is on that contrast, where it's starts uh, from what brightness level it starts spreading that contrast out. And look what happens. So now it has the same amount of contrast. It starts in a different area rather than maybe in the mid grays. It starts a little higher than the mid grays or a little lower by changing your pivot. I just slide that back and forth. That gets a little darker, but look at this. I can drag it to the left and it starts bringing back or starts restoring a little bit of detail to the highlights there. So it's kind of changing the area where the contrast occurs, where the, where the middle of the contrast occurs. And I think that works a lot better for log. Uh, you can increase the saturation on this a little bit if you want to bring a little bit of colors out of the out of the log footage. Let me show you the one shot that I shot that had where I shot in a picture profile. This is with the picture profile turned off, so it has a certain level of contrast already and a certain level of saturation. So it's it is not flat like the, the like the log footage is. But then look at the highlights. When I went to the shadows, it looked okay. This is what I think you need to kind of avoid is getting uh, details blown out, especially on the subject like this where the details blown out. It tends to look a little more video-ish rather than like film. When you shoot on film, film already has a contrasty and saturated look to it, but it tends to have a very high dynamic range that doesn't blow out the details and the highlights and the dark. So that's why film is very uh, nice to look at essentially. I think that's where it works really well here is it's not blowing out the details uh, in the darks. I am kind of crushing the darks a little bit. I could uh, lift those up a little bit and get a little detail back in those in those darks there. But it, and it's not blowing out in the highlights. In fact, let's look where the sun is shining right into the camera here. Like right here with this shot with the sun backlighting her on this on the shot right here. If I create kind of that contrasty look and add a little more saturation, notice the difference in the details here from the sun hitting the back of the face compared to this shot here where you're really blowing out the details with that with that picture profile. That's where log works a lot better, especially when you're shooting outside. Like right here, that's not blowing out the details with the backlight. All right, last thing I'm going to kind of show is with the log footage, this tend to be, this, especially in the darks, this tended to be a little bit, it tends to have a lot of noise. You tend to see a lot of noise kind of in the in the background here when you shoot in log. And like I said, the contrast can, will kill that to an extent, but especially where it's underexposed, log does not handle over underexposure very well. It handles overexposure a lot better, but that's where if you have the studio version of Resolve here, and it's actually quite affordable for a complete editing software and color grading software and sound mixer and a compositor as well. It has effect work in it as well. It's less than three hundred dollars for uh, to activate it. But then again, the free version is super super nice. It just misses out on a few features like this. I'm going to go under my little effects tab here, and you've got the temporal noise reduction and the spatial noise reduction. Temporal is basically um, measuring that noise over time as it as it uh, as it randomizes over time. You can kind of see that as I arrow through the frames here. You can kind of see the noise bouncing around there. And then the other one is spatial. How far away the grain is from each other. If it's really close together and blended together, the spatial will help clean that up as well. I find oftentimes that the temporal is all you need. I'm going to uh, do, do a measurement by, uh, by every two frames here. 
And uh, the motion estimated type here, I like to put on better. It'll do a better job of cleaning it up. It won't play back as cleanly when you're trying to just play back, uh, but it will do a better job of cleaning up. Motion range, I usually put on medium, unless there's a lot of motion range, unless there's a lot of movement in the shot here. Uh, but here, there's just kind of a normal amount of shot. Now I'm gonna grab the temporal threshold based on luma and color, based on uh, brightness levels and color, luma and chroma. I'm gonna grab this and they're in, they, and they are linked. You can unlink them and do them separately. I find that usually moving these together, at the same time, you can start to see that noise. In fact, let me get really close up here and show you the noise as it starts to clean up. So here's at zero. That's no effect applied right there. And let's go, I'm going to increase this by 10 here and hit enter and look at how it cleans up that noise. It's incredible. Uh, if you go like 30, it's going to be too exaggerated. It cleans it up and it'll start to look weird and fakey. So I'm just going to, I found that around 10 really, really worked on this shot. Hit shift Z to zoom that back out. And as I play through it, it's looking really nice. Very, very clean. And actually this is playing back pretty quickly. But the more you increase that, the more it will bog your system down. But it, it seems like I did just kind of a subtle cleanup of the noise and it looked really nice and clean. But in a nutshell, that's how I was able to get kind of that cinematic look by decreasing the, your depth of field, getting the background where it's way out of focus. And I kind of exaggerated the the, um, the depth of field here. I made it very, very shallow. But it ended up looking pretty nice. And by using a gimbal and maybe shooting in 60 frames per second, you can slow it down a little bit and get kind of a subtle slow motion. But if you're just doing a regular scene where they're just walking at a regular speed, just shoot it at 24 frames per second and have the settings that I've, that I've recommended. And using an ND, you'll achieve a pretty decent look. Well, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please post them. I'll let this play for a few seconds at the end here, just so you can kind of uh, enjoy the shots and uh, let me know if you have any questions.